Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we are returning to War in the Pacific, Admiral's Edition, my Let's Play series against Evoken. Uh, it's been a good long while uh, <laughs> since we've had uh, any real consistency around our opponents, and hopefully Evoken will uh, change that trend. But we can see here that we are into May 9th, I guess, of 1942. I had to double check that date. Uh, and it looks like we've got a Japanese submarine off Colombo, interestingly enough. Uh, we've got some Royal Navy destroyers here going after it. Looks like they're claiming a penetrating hit, uh, but we've got some nice depth charge action going here. Also, we were having our um, convoy turn back, which was on its way to Rangoon. I also saw something about a convoy retreating uh, near Rangoon, so I don't know if that's the Japanese cruiser task force we saw there or whatnot. We did try to play an airstrike out against them for this turn, but I'm not sure if anything will come of that. You can see here the depth charging claimed three hits on the Japanese submarine here. I don't think any of them were serious, though. I think we saw one side penetrated, nothing about serious damage there. So probably nothing to write home about, but we're at least harassing the Japanese submarines off Colombo before they perhaps uh, do anything against us. I did. I was sending a couple of smaller ships to the port there as well um, to try and get them to use the shipyards there to get some refits in. Uh, rather than send everybody back to South Africa. Meanwhile, we've also got additional Japanese submarine activity off Savi here, an island we recently took back from the Japanese, firing some torpedoes at a destroyer of ours, but fortunately, all of those torpedoes missed. Into the air operation phase in the AM period. We're not quite racing through this turn as quickly. We've got some Japanese Zeros sweeping over Batavia. We don't have any air cover there, so nothing to write home about. We've also got some Japanese Oscars sweeping over some of our ground troops in central central China. We likewise don't have a cap up there, so no real impact there. Curious if there's going to be any sweep over Rangoon. I did I did set up some combat air patrol over Rangoon, so it would be interesting if the Japanese try to make any kind of uh, move there. Meanwhile, we've got a fair amount of Japanese bombers hitting the ground troops at Batavia. Uh, and there's uh, 12 aircraft damage from flak there. We've also got 33. This is probably the largest raid I can recall. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong here, but a, a fairly decent sized raid here over um, the troops at Clark Field. Additional sweeps over central China. And some bombing at Nanning here in western China. I think, I, th I believe Nanning is one of the important bases that the Japanese need to seize to be able to move fuel from Singapore all the way to the east coast of China. This game probably, not probably, very unrealistically allows for certain types of supply flows to occur. And so if the Japanese player takes the right cities in China, they can actually completely short circuit the need to send any fuel via tankers to Japan from the Dutch East Indies. They can actually throw it all on tankers in the Dutch East Indies drop it at Singapore in theory, and the supply will flow all the way to the east coast of China where it can be loaded on transports and brought across, maybe even to Fusan, maybe even to uh, to Korea. I'm not sure there, but basically allows them to get around a lot of their transport and supply limitations. Nanning would definitely have to be taken for that, I believe. I think he has to take the three bases here along in southern China so they can build sort of an unbroken uh, string of bases, if you will. Uh, they don't have that yet, but it wouldn't shock me if a, if a player of Evoken's uh, character would uh, would make that effort. I suppose it could be a realistic Stein in the sense that you could, in theory, you could build a a, a, a fuel pipeline. Maybe not in instantaneous fashion, but yeah, definitely not accurate as to what existed in 1942. Um, okay. I also would imagine that there would be a very inefficient process, even in the game terms. When when transport, when supplies move across land, I believe there is an efficiency penalty where you can lose spoilage and other things like that as it moves base to base. Or maybe it would be rail, right? Maybe they'd be throwing them on rail cars. Something just sank, by the way. We got the gurgly, gurgly, gurgly of a sinking ship. Not exactly sure what. Um, but something did sink. Maybe that merchant ship that we torpedoed last turn. Hopefully it's one of theirs. I didn't see any air attacks off Rangoon, though, so their cruisers must have pulled back. Another bombardment attack at Batavia. Again, no, 
nothing really occurring there bombardment attack at clark field so this is a pretty quiet turn some submarine activity and that's about it we've got some air bases expanding at chittagong to seven coos bay to three i didn't see any trenches being built did the japanese build any pipelines during the war not that i'm aware of stein but i would not be the expert on that i don't know if you know the answer to that hauser Hmm. by rail would make sense for the game yeah that's true okay so we got some cargo ships arriving some raf units arriving a group hq in china and that's it that's all we got to say about this turn so let's go ahead and jump in and see what happened here i'm curious if we have any intel on the japanese cruisers that were at rangoon it looks like they pulled back perhaps down here to Merguay. Um, so our cargo ships did turn around. It does look like they're going to run out of fuel before they get back to Calcutta. What if we set their base to Rangoon? Can they get there at flank speed? Maybe not. We can send them at mission speed. So they pulled back, which makes me want to push my own cargo ships forward. There's no detection over them. So the Japanese, in theory, don't know they're there. I mean, I suppose he could push these guys forward again, but we can keep those aircraft set to their naval actions, I guess. He does have about 120 fighter aircraft between Chiang Mai and Bangkok that could sweep. We did bring in some fighters of our own, not quite that many. We brought in 75, 27 lightnings, and then some hurricanes. We do have the lightning set to do some escort for the attacks on Japanese shipping, should that occur. I believe they're probably out of range down here near Murugoy. So I, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I like the idea of pushing these supplies back into Rangoon because we haven't pushed any meaningful supplies in there in a few turns. We've also got another 10,000 coming out from out west here. He doesn't really seem to have much in the way of bomber. He does have about 50 bombers at Bangkok, so I shouldn't quite say that. But he doesn't seem to have a strong bomber force in the area. 120 fighters we could in theory oppose if we bring in considerable reinforcements of our own but really the key thing here is like we're bringing in all these chinese troops into rangoon and so we want to get them up to as strong of a of a force as possible they have much better supply situations in burma than they do in china for replenishment sake but if we don't keep the supplies flowing into rangoon then that's going to call some of that into question um Probably could have dropped these guys at like Akiab or somewhere to refuel, but I do think we'll take the risk. We'll send these guys back into Rangoon uh, and see. It'll take about two days for them to get there. Uh, the ships off the west coast, which are a little bit smaller of a task force, can't reach there at flank speed just quite yet either. And I don't mind the fuel inefficiency. Like if we're going to bolt in at high speed, that's fine because... Rangoon produces its own fuel, and any fuel I load on my own transports is fuel that Japan won't get in the event that they retake, or not retake, but take Rangoon. I'm a little uneasy about leaving large numbers of aircraft at, Rang at Rangoon for too long, because I think it will draw too much attention and, and may result in, you know, the, the Japanese coming in and, and bombing us there and whatnot and destroying aircraft on the ground or just leading to a to a conflict I don't really want to have at the moment if we don't have to. On the flip side, I do want to bring in supplies, and so to do that, I do need some aircraft protecting there. At this point, can they even take Burma? I think so. Maybe not this minute. So I think Japan will certainly have the strength to take Burma, I think. There's, there's two main reasons for that. One, there's a very inefficient fuel transport over these mountains here from India to Burma. So in order to, to sustain large-scale operations and reinforcements in Burma... It does produce some of its own supplies and some of its own fuel, but you really do need to bring in additional supplies for a large-scale conflict. Japan can bring supplies from all over into there because of the road networks. The Allies really can't. I, the, the way that the mechanics work for the Burma Road is basically assuming shipping is arriving at Rangoon and pushing supplies over the mountains, but that doesn't really work both ways. Like I suppose Burma could act as a supply sink and draw supplies out of China if China had enough. But China probably won't ever. 
Um, and so like to really amp things up here, we're going to need to push supplies in periodically. And that really means pushing supplies into Rangoon. The Japanese can shut that down with air power. Naval air power can shut this waterway down with Bell Nels and Bettys and whatnot. Um, and so they could do that and really limit our ability to send supplies through. We'd still have some supply, but probably not enough to wage a super aggressive campaign. And so I think that would hurt us long term, especially if we get like a large scale scale air battle going, especially with bombers and other things like that, trying to stop their offensive. Um, we'd be better off launching our bombers from India, I think. Even if we have sufficient supply, though, the thing you got to keep in mind is they have that massive force that took Singapore. Now, I believe some of those troops are down south at Batavia right now in the process of mopping up the Dutch East Indies. There's at least two divisions at Clark Field in the Philippines. But what I would say is like Japan, what they really sh what they could do and, and maybe they won't do it yet. I don't know if they have the strength to do it yet, but I do think once the Dutch East Indies fall, once the Philippines fall, and those are those are not questions. Those will occur, um, and the Philippines probably sooner rather than later, based on the supply situation here. You can see the supply situation is desperate in the Philippines right now. We're going to start seeing units begin to waste away. That hasn't quite happened yet, but like even some of these units, uh, granted, we did have some fighting going on, um, but that that hasn't quite started yet. But that will start in the next couple of weeks. So these units could waste away. They could bring two fresh divisions in. They could bring at least three divisions in from Batavia, maybe more. So they could easily bring in six quality divisions into, into Burma. We do have a fair amount of troops there ourselves. The 18th British Division is actually not great, but they're well-equipped. Uh, their experience levels aren't great. The 7th Australian Division is very good. Um, the 1st Burma Division is big, but it's bad. The 7th India Division is decent. Um, so like we've got four divisions here and then some supporting troops. The seventh armored is excellent. And so that may play a pivotal role in allowing us to hold. Um, and then the, the troops we've sent in from China, the, the fifth Chinese Corps, which is in the process of arriving at, uh, at Rangoon will certainly help make their ability to overrun us, uh, called into question, but that doesn't mean they can't do it. And I do think they could bring in seven, eight, maybe nine divisions into Burma, and they could definitely overrun us there. The real question, I think, comes down to what else are the Japanese going to do with all these forces that they have? I don't think an invasion of Australia is likely, at least not in the near term. I don't think they have the shipping. I don't think uh, they have the resources to support that. I also don't think the, the, the net gain is there. Burma is a problem for Japan because if Burma doesn't fall... Once we start getting these longer range bombers, we can start destroying oil refineries in Bangkok. We can start hitting shipping in places like Haiphong. We can start bombing certain elements uh, early with the B-24 and then more elements later with the B-29, like their oil production at Maiden, which is important. Um, the B-29, I think, might actually be able to reach as far as Palembang once that comes online. Granted, that's not for a little while still. But Burma really is a problem for Japan if they leave that open as a as an airfield. So I do think they want to take Burma before other places. B-29s were in the Pacific. For sure, pistol. For sure. I assume that's sarcasm. So yeah, I do think Burma's got to be Japan's priority number one. And so the question again, if, if the Philippines fall, which it will, the Dutch East Indies fall, which it will, where are they going to put all of their, their army strength? They've already pushed as far south as New Caledonia. I don't think they're going to make a play for New Zealand, but who knows? We've reinforced there. It wouldn't be an easy thing. They could make a push for Fiji, but again, like to what end? That's way at the end of their supply lines. Fiji might make sense if they're going to go for New Zealand and trying to cut Australia off entirely from supplies from the U.S. West Coast, but we can still supply through Perth from South Africa. So... You know, this would take months of time to take Fiji probably and, and then more months to take New Zealand. I think the immediate short-term answer is definitely Burma. So that would be that would be my guess. Meanwhile, if we take a look at Batavia, last I checked it had over 30,000. It still has over 30,000 supplies, 31,000. They have done quite a bit of damage to the airfield and the port aircraft here what do we all have still still the one b17 repairing i'd love to get it out of there b17s are very rare we don't we don't have enough of them 
or fairly rare, I guess, maybe not very, but I'd love to get it out of there. The rest of these aircraft are, are Dutch aircraft, so I can't move them to a base because they're all restricted to this headquarter. They're all permanently restricted too, like they don't have a unlockable headquarter that I can shift them around. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think Burma's likely. What's down here? PT boats. Maybe some tankers in port. Not sure. Um, we did move some ships into Colombo. I am not sure if any of those are upgradable quite yet. Yes. All right, so we've got a Helena class light cruiser, which have a lot of six inch guns. We've got a Brooklyn class light cruiser and a, actually two Brooklyn class light cruisers and a Helena. The upgrade will take 17 days at a minimum. It requires a size five shipyard for all of these cruisers here. The, um, the Helenas are 21. The Helenas 20. Oh, shit. I'm skipping ahead upgrades. I'm still on the same ship. So the question is, do we have enough? One, do we have enough shipyard space? I think we do. We've got 40,000 tons of shipping that can be, I believe, repaired here at any one time. None of it's in use. Now, the risk is that the Japanese send, like, a carrier task force into, Sila, into the Bay of Bengal and hit these guys at anchor and do a lot of damage to some pretty damn good light cruisers. So that, that is a risk. Um, I'm going to take that risk right now. I suppose Evoken could make a play for that, but whatever. We've got, we've got some air power there. We've got some recon. We can rush aircraft from Calcutta to, to Sri Lanka if we need to. So we're going to go ahead and set those three light cruisers up to upgrade. What is this? What, what's their tonnage again? 10,000 tons, 9,700 and 9,700. So they'll, they'll be well below the 40,000 max upgrades. This is a multiplayer game, Van, uh, Van Dong. And then are these destroyers ready for upgrades too? That one is not. This one is. And so is this one. So we've got plenty of space for two destroyers and three cruisers. Again, it's in a place Japan could bomb in theory, but um, we'll take the risk. There's been two. What's been two? We haven't had two midways. How's, oh, you're talking about the fact that so Midway was invaded and fell to the Japanese and we uh, we counter invaded and retook it back recently. Midway's still a smoking pile of rubble, port damage 100, airfield damage 100, service down to 76. But we haven't had like an actual carrier action yet, the Big Bang. Not a carrier versus carrier. We did torpedo the Hor Hir Hiryu with a Dutch submarine not that long ago. Uh, and uh, we put two torpedoes into the Hiryu, although almost certain she is fine, but we at least damaged her within the last month or so. Cameron Bay has some tankers in it, which would make me, again, like that's another one of those things that could be in reach of B-24s, uh, and almost B-20, B-17s out of Rangoon too, so that's something to consider. I'm also working on expanding fortifications, so Rangoon's at level three, all, three quarters of the way to level four. Pegu is at level three, two thirds of the way to level four. Mole mine is at level three, working toward level four. It just turned to level three. So we're trying to fortify these positions as well to make it less likely that the, uh, that the Japanese would um, be able to easily overrun us in Burma. I don't think they can easily do it. They could do it, I think, but they can't do it easily. And I was talking about like the need for Japan to take certain bases or whatever to open up transporting fuel and supplies from uh, Indochina into uh, the Korean area. I believe what they would need to do is take Quilin because in theory, like they could take Nanning and they could take Lucho, but these are such bad roads. I don't know that that would really work. I think they would have to take Nanning, Lucho, and Quilin, all currently in our control. But if they do take those... And they've got a railway all the way up to the border with China between North Vietnam and China, um, or I guess Vietnam and China. And then they've got a major road to Nanning and then Lucho. And then from Lucho to 
Changsha, they have this like super highway. It's like railway and major road. That's what these little black lines with white dashes mean. Uh, and then that would give them major roadways all the way into into Shanghai or into into Korea actually as well. So I think if they take these three bases, that's that unlocks that logistical ability. Uh, but they they're not there yet, and we've actually got a, a decent roadblock here with some troops that are in some good defensive terrain. They've got level two forts in sort of to the northeast of Quilin. And then we're also working on the fortifications of Quilin, which are almost to level four now as well. So you can see they're level three, 92% of the way to level four. Uh, we've got some, just a couple of units there. So it'd largely be the troops that are in the open that would fall back there. Uh, and then we are also working on the forts at Lucho, which are about halfway to level four. And Nanning is at level three, I don't know that it'll ever get to level four. We don't even really have a lot of troops in Nanning. Pretty limited. But, you know, that's what we're looking at doing here. We're obviously looking at uh, building our troops up in China. We still have the Burma Road open, which helps a lot. It gives us a, a good chunk of free supply every single day, which makes, you know, as long as China has sufficient supply, they've got a lot of troops. The key is, like, having enough supply to draw replacements. It's not real time. It's one turn per one day. So it's like old school play by email. Um, all right. So what else do we want to look at here? Does it tell us, do we have any idea what maybe sank this, this turn? We got a, a blurbity blurb. No indication of what sank from the enemy. Uh, all dates. As a reminder, the largest ships that have been sunk so far... Japanese battleship Haruna is the largest warship that's been sunk on either side and confirmed to be sunk. 182 victory points, one battleship, the only capital ship sunk so far. Our largest loss was the Houston, and then we had the troop transport President Coolidge. Somehow the Japanese botched Pearl Harbor. We had a lot of ships damaged. We still have ships damaged from air, but, uh, but nothing really sunk. So we can see here we've got the battleship California and Tennessee both under repair at Pearl right now. Still going to be under repair for a while. And then if we actually take a look at what we have ready in May of 42, we've got the Colorado, Nevada, Oklahoma, Idaho, New Mexico, and Mississippi. And we also have the British battleship War Spite currently there as well. They all just got back from bombarding Midway when we retook it not that long ago. Um, and then our one carrier here. Does Hornet have an upgrade coming? Not until July. So... When's our next carrier coming online anyway? Let's go ahead and take a look. Ship availability. Looks like the Wasp is coming online in 31 days. So that's our next carrier, I believe. A little over a month. We do have the escort carrier Long Island. Um, and then we've got a whole bunch of auxiliaries and whatnot between now and then. West Virginia, she is somewhere. I think she's repairing uh, West Virginia. No, that's Pennsylvania is at San Diego. She's a three months, a little over three months out from being back in action. We've got the Maryland, which was just completed its repair work at, uh, is that Los Angeles? Yeah. Uh, the Arizona has one day left until she's done repairing in San Francisco. She did not go boom. And the West Virginia has a month and a half left of repairs. She's at Mare Island, which I guess isn't Mare Island technically in. Wouldn't Mare Island technically be San Francisco? Is it really far away from San Francisco? By the way, I feel bad. Almeida is here. Mare Island is here. San Francisco is here. Poor Oakland, right? Poor Oakland. Oakland doesn't get a hex. Man, that feels just, just you know, gonna gonna overlook them, right? Poor Oakland, always overlooked, right? Oakland always gets always gets the short end of the straw. Um, speaking of other battleships and other capital ships, where are our other ones? Air combat. We've got the Repulse, which survived again. The Japanese didn't. They, to be fair, because we didn't do the historic December 7th start, we were allowed to adjust some things. Basically, our initial start, we said, like, no, you can't put all your battleships out of Pearl, which would be dumb anyway, because then the Japanese would sink them at sea. 
but like we, we did give some flexibility. So I didn't charge forward with the British battleships quite as rashly as, uh, as the British did. Um, so the repulse and the Prince of Wales did not get sunk. We did fight a battle off the Northeast coast of Singapore at uh, Mersing, where the Japanese were trying to land an additional landing force further south to flank the entire Manila Peninsula and cut all those troops off in the north. Um, but the Japanese player at the time, XTRG, was also new to the game, and so he did not exactly know what he was doing, and we did not get hit by air, air attacks with our battleships. We actually fought a night action, and the Repulse took a torpedo or two, and the Prince of Wales took like two or three torpedoes, we limped back to Singapore, and then we escaped. <laughs> we, we limped out of Singapore after sitting there for a few days to patch up some holes, and we were able to get out to safety. Repulsa spent the last five months being repaired, but she was just completed uh, being repaired. So Repulse is on her way back into action with the Illustrious, a new British carrier, which has just arrived. Uh, and these guys are on their way to Bombay in India. Uh, and then the Prince of Wales is one day away from sailing to England. So she still has a fair bit of damage here. You can see 39 major flood damage, 38 engine damage. Max cruise speed is six knots. Max speed overall is 11 knots. But if you make max speed, then you, you risk like additional flood and engine damage, which could lead to sinking or other things like that. So, you know, she's about to leave south africa though and head to england because the shipyards in england are much better and would be able to repair her much more quickly nonetheless one day away from prince of wales commissioning back to sail back to england and uh, hopefully getting repaired there efficiently um, but you can see she's been out of action basically since like december 9th or so um all right why is it one x shouldn't it just be one day just just let me come out of pier side right Or do we need to un? So we gotta actually undo that there. So set to set to readiness, and she's ready not no, ready in three days. Really? Okay. Well, whatever. Anyway, she'll be ready in three days to move. Hermes is also in in uh, South Africa with her uh, U.S. Marines are on uh, are on the British carrier, uh, flying F four F Wildcats. Meanwhile, I'm in the process of sending my own carriers to South Africa to see some over over or uh, some refits. So we've got the Lexington and the Saratoga, which are both on the way to South Africa because they are both overdue for a upgrade, which I'm not sure what the upgrade does. I think it replaces the 1.1 inch guns and 50 caliber machine guns with better anti-aircraft. Doesn't replace the 1.1s, but it does replace at least some of the 50 cals or, or at least it adds 20 millimeter Orlikons which makes it a much more difficult target to attack because the or Orlicons kick ass. So those guys are both on their way to South Africa. The rest of our carriers are currently chilling in Bombay, I believe, or in task forces at Bombay. We've got the Enterprise here, the British carrier Formidable, and then the Yorktown and the British carrier Indomitable. Which makes sense that we've deployed them as such because Burma, again, seems to be, in my opinion, the most important theater at the moment right now based on the way that the war is unfolding. We already kind of looked at China. and We did see he was doing some air reconnaissance over central China. You can see here, uh, Chikikang has level five airfields. It does have 120 aviation support, so it would be a good place to base some of our air force in central China if we wanted to try and fight a battle to defend central China. We uh, do have level five forts. We're, all, we're actually a third of the way to level six forts. The engineers here, there's no engineer vehicles. They're doing it all by hand. Uh, and then we've got some troops here in, in central China, just in some rough terrain on the opposite side of this river here. These guys have level two forts. These guys move to the east. They have level two. Nobody's yet to level three. I think level three is the highest level of fort you can have when you're not in a base. No Italian troops, as far as I'm aware, in the theater. Uh, and then Cyan, we are, we're at level four forts, but Cyan's an open terrain, which makes it vulnerable to tanks. But the intention is to set up a roadblock at Cyan, but then really have our main forts in, in northern China here in these mountains, 
to protect the flank move into Chikikang. These troops here in central China and at uh, Chikikang, or the, sorry, Chungking, uh, these forces here in central China and Chikikang are intended to stop a direct drive through these mountains toward Chungking. And then what I think is the vulnerable portion of China, sort of this soft underbelly along these railways and down toward Quilin. This allows for the Japanese to transport troops very quickly. It allows them to move supplies very efficiently. And while there are multiple bases with decent defensive terrain hexes, they're not all great. These guys are in rough terrain. These guys are in wooded terrain. And then even if you get down toward Lucho, it's in clear terrain. So if we go back up here toward the top right, we can see what WD gives you a times two defense, which is basically forest or wooded terrain. WR is forced plus rough, so that's better terrain, which is why we pushed out to the east here. This is actually times three terrain, plus if our troops get into level three forts in the open, that makes it even more difficult. Plus, when you're in the open, engineers can't permanently reduce your fortifications. So this is three and open, or this is three and rough. This is two, but with a base with a level three fort and possibly soon level four. But the problem is these fortifications can be reduced by Japanese engineers, which makes this less ideal than the three forts here that can't be reduced. So there's a there's a lot of, of detail here in this game that, that really, I mean, it's, it's an absurd amount of detail. <laughs> Um, the Ark Royal, I don't think she's in the Pacific. I think she was already sunk by this point in history, wasn't she? Or was she sunk during uh, North Africa? I can't remember exactly when she was sunk. But uh, the British do have a considerable air presence at this point in time. So we can see here the Indomitable has to be withdrawn by July of 42. But at the moment, she's in the Pacific. Uh, we also have the uh, Formidable. And she's with us until September of 42. And then we have the Illustrious, which is here until January of 43. So these withdraw dates, basically the way this works is certain ships to reflect the fact that this is a global war and is not just limited to the Pacific theater. Certain ships, typically very often British warships, have to be withdrawn from the map to reflect that they get put to other theaters. So if it gets sunk before the withdrawal date, withdraw date, you don't have to worry about it. But like ships like this, the Illustrious has to leave the Pacific Theater by January of 43. And so these ships, these other ships, if you don't withdraw them, if you don't get them to a, to a port and give the option for the ship to withdraw... You can keep units, and, and it's true for some ground units too. Um, you can keep units, you can keep ships in theater longer, but you have to pay a victory point penalty. So you can see here right now the Japanese have 15,000 victory points, the Allies have 10,000. Obviously the Japanese are ahead by a little bit. However, um, you know that if the Allies don't counterattack, you're going to lose, right? Um, those victory points should change as the war goes on. If Japan has three times their victory point allotment by the end of 1942, which they're not even close, they'd have to, get, they'd have to double their victory points to, to get to three times what we're at right now. Um, if they get three times their victory points by the end of 1942, then the game has an auto victory for Japan. If they have two times their victory points by the end of 1943, there's an auto victory for Japan. And then after that point, it just goes to like 45 or whatever and it looks at scores then. Um, but if you don't withdraw true, if you don't withdraw the ships as they're supposed to withdraw, you pay a victory point penalty. So you can see here, these are all the ships that have to withdraw. Some of the ships you withdraw, like the, uh, AP, the troop transport, Henry T. Allen, she you have to withdraw her when, uh, September of 42, she will actually come back in, uh, December of 42. So she's only off for a couple of months. So some ships do have a return date, not all of them. So the Indomitable, you can see, withdraws in July, uh, but she will actually come back in June of 42, or 44. So that's to reflect this. It's interesting because the British had a very large buildup of carriers and battleships in the Indian Ocean, like just before, up until kind of shortly after, historically, anyway, the Battle of Midway. And I, I don't know a lot about the politics behind that. I don't know if, if the... Or maybe it's political points, uh, Cal. I thought it was victory points, but you might be right. It might be a political point penalty. 
uh, which political points are different than victory points. You use political points to unlock units or move units between headquarters or things like that. Um, they're pretty important, especially for unlocking American divisions that are locked to the West Coast if you want to strengthen yourself in the Pacific. Um, but uh, but in any event, um, the it's interesting because the the British did have a pretty large buildup in uh, the Indian Ocean up until like shortly after the Battle of Midway. And I don't know if they were building up because Pearl happened and so the U.S. asked for help and the British put a bunch of ships there if it was in response to Singapore falling. I, I don't know the politics behind that, but I do know that shortly after Midway, a lot of those ships got pulled back to the Mediterranean uh, as things got going there with the, the North Africa campaign. Protecting India from Japan. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that, that was a big part of it. We do have three battleships at Mombasa, the Revenge, Ramillies, and Resolution. The fleet that had to hide, Anaris? Is that about the, because the Brit, that's the other thing. The Japanese, before before Midway, the Japanese actually launched a raid into the Indian Ocean. And they, I believe, launched some bombing raids on Sri Lanka. And the British, the British fleet basically had to escape from the Japanese carriers before they showed up. They, they withdrew the fleet uh, before the Japanese hit the island uh, because they, they didn't really have a good chance of, of fighting the Japanese. I thought they deployed some carriers to try and find them, but they didn't uh, or something like that which would be pretty stupid if the British actually tried to fight the, the Kitty Butai. Like, that would have been a mind-bogglingly stupid thing. The British would have been so horribly outclassed. I, they did find the Hermes, uh, and they did sink Hermes. And they also sank, was it Dorchester, the, the armored cruiser? Not armored cruiser. Oh, my God, I've been playing too much Ultimate Admiral. The, uh, the heavy cruiser. But they did sink the Hermes, which has not been sunk yet here. They bravely ran away. But I, I could have sworn the British fleet actually deployed to try and fight their fleet carriers anyway, with the battleships running away. Um, but I, maybe I'm wrong on that. Force Z was supposed to be a lot larger than it was. Yeah, they only sent two battleships, but but it should have been more. But this is, that's not why the fleet is what it was. I, maybe the fleet's response was in response to losing Repulse and Prince of Wales. I don't know. Anyway, uh, that's only to me talking. I'm trying to think if there's anything else we should be showing you. It was a pretty quiet turn. Uh, hmm. Yeah, we're loading some additional supply here. These guys are going to go to rain good. Nope. Thank you, Hauser. Got to ban the bots. Did I play Civ 6? Because Civ 7 wasn't recently announced. I have, I played a little bit of Civ 6. Never on the channel as far as I'm aware. You put a link into the Discord? All right, cool. Thanks, Anaris. I'll check that out. Um, how's the uh, fort building in Auckland going? For level four, twenty five percent, and level three, four percent. Okay. What's our uh, political point situation right now? Seven thirty five. That's decent. I don't know if it's enough to unlock anything, but we can't unlock that division. She's locked. Well. Los Angeles. Ninth Marine Regiment has arrived. Where are the other ones on this? Oh, yeah, we're loading her up. And then San Diego in 52 and 127 days. And, okay. So the 3rd Marine Division will be available to us in... 127 days if we get all three of these regiments in the same place. But I don't want to wait four months to get these 9th Marine Regiment boys into action, so we're going to send them to an island somewhere to do something. Permanently locked, South Pacific. Do we not have any other divisions I can do anything with? I suppose these guys aren't permanently locked. So the 159th Motorized Rifle 
or infantry regiment. It would cost 435 points to change their headquarters to a non-restricted West Coast headquarters if we wanted to move them forward. They've got motorized support, but they don't actually have, like, any armor. They're a decent unit. They've got a reasonable experience level. I thought there was another division or two I wanted to unlock, but I can't really find them. Oh, yeah, the 41st. 41st division is going to cost us 1900 I think we get like 50 political points per turn, so we might need to wait a little bit. But I'd, I'd rather get the 41st into action because we're currently locked to the West Coast. I can't, I can't choose any of these other headquarters quite yet. Okay. Yeah, you're thinking Force Z, though, Hauser. I'm thinking of after that. Like, during the Indian Ocean raid, the, the British did deploy to try and intercept the British. It's a fairly steep learning curve, Strub. You can dink around with it. It's it's a pretty extensive game, but there's a lot of guides and, and tips and tricks and whatnot in the forms. Yes, the forms of, uh, of Matrix Games, the, the publisher for the game. But it is pretty, I mean, this is a 12 plus year old game, so it's, it's, it does show its age a bit. In any event, though, um, I think maybe that's it for this turn. I don't know what, uh, anything else you guys want to see before we wrap this, uh, this episode up for the, for the war in the Pacific portion. You can see here air to air losses, three Japanese aircraft lost operationally, nothing else by anyone else. Looks like they lost Jake's and Topsy's, maybe a zero as well. They're up to 290 zeros lost since the start of the war. Top pilots. We've got Cole, T. Cole was killed. He's still our leading ace. We've got four guys with seven. And one of them is a, is a Dutch pilot here. Van Harlem. I think we withdrew that squadron, which they may come back. I think they come back in Mombasa after like 90 days. And then we've got a P-40E pilot in AVG-1, BD Wagner, and we've got CH Older and uh, Greg Boynton or Pappy Boynton, all with seven kills. I thought Boynton would be flying the, uh, isn't the squadron got the P-38s? They do. Boynton's in the squadron still. 84 experience. He's still flying. Uh, what about Sigan? We haven't looked at that at all today. Any intelligence worth reports? The 8th Independent Engineers are planning for an attack in Cyan. I think we saw that a few turns ago. We do know the Japanese made a push for Cyan, so it's possible Evokin just hasn't updated the planning for the units, but it is also possible he may be making a move towards Cyan. Not really groundbreaking intelligence. You kind of figure that's that's an objective for the Japanese. Fifty first Recon Regiment is planning for an attack on Cyan as well. I guess that does increase the likelihood of a drive there just because there's multiple units that you're picking up that is their objective. 10th Division is at Harbin. 57th Infantry Brigade is planning for an attack on Cyan. That's three units planning for an attack on Cyan. So I suppose that might indicate that he is likely pushing there. I don't know that I've ever seen three units with the same, with that much, focus on one base. Have a good one, Scott. Need a better intelligence report? Well, keep in mind, the intelligence report changes every turn. You do get detailed info sometimes about, like, specific ships and things like that. Last time we saw the fleet, the carriers were at Singapore. Do we have any, uh, can we, like, maybe do a recon flight over Singapore? Can these guys reach that far? All right, go fly to Singapore and tell me what's in the port there. <laughs> good job. Good luck. Good luck flying flying boats. OK. 
Okay. There's also like different tools people use. Um, War in the Pacific Tracker, like will keep track of all your intelligence reports and things like that. So you can like better track what's going on. Also, how do how are we doing? We're pulling troops out of matter. Remember, we were pulling that one Dutch battalion out. I think it was the Prahoda garrison. We were ordering flying boats to pull them out. Looks like they still have about 400 troops behind and 13 infantry units. We are up to 21 assault. I think we're at 17 before at Batavia. So we've got up to 20 infantry squads. So we've got about half the unit and a little bit less than half the unit in terms of manpower wise. But we're up to 20 infantry squads here with 21 assault value into, uh, into Batavia as we slowly pull them out. Now, by moving that one group to recon um, Singapore, that does slow down the troop transports, pulling those guys out. But I, I'm okay with that. The assault value here of these guys is still short of 1,000. It's at 919. But those additional 20 some odd assault value, maybe that'll come in handy. We've also got, I keep, we have. Part of the 8th Australian Division is here. I think these guys were originally going to Singapore. Memory serves. Um, but yeah. Anyway, that's that's kind of... Yeah, you can definitely get lost in micromanagement. I think that's probably going to do it for today's episode, though. I'm um, just checking one or two more things. Ground unit withdrawals. Anybody, anybody pulling out soon? Eight days. Well, that's a convoy thing. We get uh, Valentine tanks to our pool. So this represents a supply convoy to South Africa. Some Matildas. Do we... I'm wondering if when we, they withdraw, that's when we get the actual items to the pool. Or if it's before. I can't remember. I'm assuming we don't have those items in the pool quite yet. Let's go check out the pool. And I don't think anyone's pulled them from the pool quite yet. So we go to all right, turn all device types off. Go to AFVs. In pool. Valentine tanks three. Seven have been used so far. So yeah, we definitely don't have those guys haven't arrived yet. So I assume they'll arrive when that when that ground unit withdraws. I would think. What are we? How are we doing on um, troops here? So let's let's pull the Soviet stuff out because we can't really don't really have access to that quite yet. Mm. I don't really need industry. It's more. Let's, let's take a look at squads. So we have a lot of naval support. That's fine. A good amount of support units. We've used over 5,000. We have 203 Chinese cavalry squadrons. We've only used one so far. 196 Filipino army rifle squads, but they're all in places we don't have any supply, so they're not going to draw. 102 U.S. heavy machine gun sections. That's a lot of freaking heavy machine gun sections. 91 U.S. rifle squads. We've used 200, we've used 120 or 216 so far. 86 Australian infantry sections of 1942. That's actually a good chunk. That's like almost a whole brigade. And we're getting 55 per month. So that's actually a pretty decent chunk of, uh, I guess, Australia's mobilizing. New Zealand, that's a very slow build rate. We've got 75 militia sections. Malicious crap anyway, so who cares? Uh, 63 U.S. 1941s. 55 Canadian infantry sections. We might be able to outfit one of those brigades with militia troops and, and upgrade them to infantry soon. Get the Canadians into the Pacific War. I'm sure they'll love that. The CMF China? I feel like CMF might be China. But where where are the Chinese rifle squads? Is there is there nobody... No, CMF is probably Commonwealth. We have no Chinese rifle squads in our pools at the moment. That's nuts. That is absolute bonkers. That's because we've used so many of them. We've used 1,800. So we are drawing re replacements. We used 11 of them last turn. 
So we are reinforcing those troops considerably, strengthening our Chinese forces on the map. We did also lose a lot of troops at the Battle of Changsha and a couple other places as well. We're getting 350 of them a month, by the way. So we get a big chunk. I don't know the difference between the grayed out ones and the uh, not grayed out ones, other than these guys aren't available yet because they're grayed out. But yeah. All right. Anyway, guys, I think that's probably going to do it for today. A little bit of a longer look at our uh, current situation here. But with that being said, that's where we're going to wrap things up here today. So I hope you guys enjoyed our War in the Pacific Admiral's Edition episode. A fairly quiet one, uh, but we'll see how things play out in our next episode. Until our next episode, this is the Historical Gamer saying once again, thank you very much for watching. And until next time, I'm out. Bye-bye. No, really. Bye.